Hello everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Kent Dillamich with Cessna Flyer and Piper Flyer Associations. Tonight we have Amy Gash, Piston Aircraft and Product Sales Manager and Kurt Snedeker, a Product a Maintenance Manager at Whip Air. And tonight they're gonna to be discussing returning to the water, getting your floats ready. Here is Amy and Kurt. Hey everyone, we're gonna do a little bit of a uh, shared presentation here. So we're gonna start off with Kurt. And uh, so let me pull up the presentation and then we'll get, uh, get going for Kurt to introduce himself. And so again, uh, we are here from uh, Whip Air, but all of this advice is gonna be relatively usable with any set of floats uh, or any aircraft that's gonna be you know, getting back on the water, coming out of storage or winter hibernation. Well, Kurt, I'll let Kurt introduce himself and tell you a little bit about his background. Uh, he's going to be starting the first side of first part of this, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about myself on the next slide. Hello, everybody. I'm Kurt Snedeker. I'm the maintenance shop manager at Whip Air. Uh, I've been in generally general aviation or with the airlines for 40 years. Uh, uh, been with Whip Air for 16 years working in the maintenance shop, both as a mechanic, a supervisor, and a and now the shop manager. And then this is me. Uh, so if you've seen some of our other previous webinars, you may have seen me before. Uh, I am Whip Air's product and piston aircraft sales manager, which means that I cover Whip Air ST seed modifications and floats for aircraft ranging in size from the Piper Super Cub all the way up to the Cessna 206. Uh, in the US, Canada, and the Caribbean. I have an international counterpart that serves the broad range of all of our products. And then uh, here, the US, Canada, Caribbean territory, I also have a uh, co worker that handles all of our larger products, which is to say the de Havilland Beaver up through the uh, Viking and de Havilland Twin Otter. Um, I also do pre owned aircraft sales for Whip Air, specializing in four and six cylinder piston airplanes. So again, things very similar to the airplanes that we put on floats, uh, Super Cubs, Huskies, 172s, 182s, 206s, and all of that. Uh, so, and I personally am a, a pilot and aircraft owner. So we will get started with some of the maintenance side. So again, you're going to hear from Kurt first. I might chime in if, uh, if I have any observations, but for the most part, we'll have Kurt take it away. Okay, well, some of this stuff uh, depends obviously on how your floats were stored. If they were stored inside in a heated environment or outside in a uh, cold winter environment. Uh, but the first thing that's a good thing to do is uh, when you get them to wherever you're going to install them is to look them over really well and look for damage that may have happened during storage. Uh, if other items were moved around, uh, around those floats, things can bump into them. Uh, uh, dent the skin or uh, maybe even puncture the skin. Uh, you want to make sure that everything is in good condition and uh, not going to create problems after you get it in the water. Uh, wash them down, uh, get all the uh, debris off of them that might have fallen, especially if they were outside. You'll be getting leaves and, and uh, seeds from trees and animals may have made their home near them. Uh, just take care of the exterior with a real quick glance and look them over and make sure there was no damage. Uh, the other thing is if they're stored outside, uh, it would have been a good idea when you put them into storage to put antifreeze in, uh, in the bays to make sure that water would, that does get inside of the floats through the seals. If snow sits on top of them, it won't freeze and create damage. Uh, by freezing and expanding, which uh, will happen if there's water gets in them without having uh, antifreeze. Uh, if there is, if there was antifreeze in them, then you would pump all that out of there and, uh, and make sure that that's out of there just for weight savings. You don't want to haul around all that stuff if you don't have to. Uh, the other things to uh, consider is uh, if you, prior to putting them in storage, if you uh, grease all the grease points uh, to prevent water from causing corrosion damage during storage. Uh, if you have not done that, then it's a good idea then to grease all the grease points. Pack the wheel bearings. Uh, there's grease zerks on the axles. Pump them full of grease, which will uh, uh, 
push out any uh, moisture that might have condensed in there. If there was, uh, if you did not pack them before storage, then you could have bearing issues uh, from sitting uh, from the bearing setting in the same spot. You could get corrosion on the races and the wheel bearings. So uh, that might be something you may have to go farther with uh, than just a visual. You may have to uh, uh, jack them, uh, put the floats up on a stand on the forward keel by the step and maybe take the wheels off even and, and check the wheel bearings. Uh, but if you greased them beforehand, likely they'll be okay. Just grease them again and you can run them both the mains and the nose. Uh, check the air in the tires because over the winter they're going to lose air. Uh, it's a good idea to make sure that they're all aired up to the proper air pressures for, uh, for use so you don't prematurely wear your tires out. And uh, once again, make sure you pump them because water will uh, over time seep through the seals on top of the covers. Uh, and it will get inside of all the bays. So make sure you pump them out really well. Uh, you may have, uh, if you have seals that were compromised the season before, you could end up with a significant amount of water in them. So make sure you pump all the float bays out. Uh, if in fact you did not put any freeze in them, do a very close inspection for water freeze damage. Uh, those of you in a warm environment, this would not apply, but uh, a colder environment that uh, there could be some significant water damage from freezing done to the floats. Uh, uh, and another good idea is to take the steering cables and run a rag down, uh, down those cables, not, well, not with your bare hand or you'll, uh, you could end up getting cuts on your hand from frayed cables, if you will. Uh, it's a good idea to run a rag down them before you install the cables and, and rig it to make sure that the uh, there's no frayed cables from the season before. Uh, after you mount the floats on the airplane, make sure you run the gear repeatedly to, to see if there were any uh, developed issues with the hydraulic power pack or the uh, cylinders over the storage season. Uh, if you if you don't have that ability, you can cycle the gear after the floats are put into the water, and if they're amphibious, and cycle the gear repeatedly to just to make sure that the pump cycles are correct and everything's looking good there. Uh, that's really the high spots of areas you might want to to look at. The visual is a big one through after storage because uh, there's a lot of things can happen during storage that you may not even know about. Uh, with other people moving around your floats that uh, there could be damage done that you you may not even notice until you give it a close examination. Yeah, and Kurt, I think we have some, some kind of more pictures of some of the items you're talking about. So I'll start to click through them a little bit. Um, you know, like just like you said, things from sitting where, you know, we run disc brakes and if they're not used and if they're humid or they went away wet, this could be some of the sort of things that we'd be seeing. Yep, that's correct. And the, the corrosion on the brake discs, as you're seeing here, uh, is not abnormal. And most of that will, with the first couple of applications of the brake after they're, they're uh, used, will will We'll grind that off, if you will, or, or, or uh, brush that off of there as you do the uh, first couple of braking actions. Uh, so that, that's nothing to be too worried about. It, it would be the, the wear on the brake disc would, is much more important than those, that little surface corrosion you see there. Yeah, and I think there's a, one of the things that you guys have mentioned to me is that there's a little bit of a difference between surface corrosion that's gonna wear off with the first couple applications of the brakes uh, in pitting, which is kind of a, a deeper corrosion. Is there, you know, a, is there a general guideline for when something like that brake disc is, is considered it's time for replacement based on how much pitting or, or thickness is left on it? Yeah, there's a, a micrometer check. You measure it with a, what's called a pin mic to measure the deepest, uh, the spot of wear and or corrosion pits. And once they reach the limit, uh, then that that part should be changed. 
And those limits are, are set by the brake disc manufacturer, correct? Correct, yeah. They're, and they vary yeah. from, from float, float model to float model, model and everything. Float. Yeah, okay, makes sense. Let's see what we've got coming up here next. So uh, some bearings, I assume that we can tell which one is doing <laughs> A lot of explanation needed there. Uh, the, yeah. uh, the one on the left is, uh, is something that you you very well could see if if a, a little pre-greasing isn't done before storage, uh, that which would be another subject to be discussed on another date. But uh, that sitting in one spot with moisture, not even not even liquid water, but the water can mix with the grease and cause this to happen. So it's a good idea to pump those full until you get clean grease out uh, before you put them in storage. Yeah, and that's all about displacing the moisture because between the humidity and then like it sits in the cup of the of the wheel too, right? So you can have just a little bit and it can just create humidity in that whole right. whole component. Right. Yeah. And the and the damage can be as severe as what you see here, or it could be just etched marks where the rollers are contacting the race uh all winter long. It may be very subtle, but there can be uh uh lines across the face of the race that are actually have depth to them that will cause either noisy rough operation and, and lead to premature failure. Yeah, and, and all of all of this, I suppose you'll you'll hear kind of a consistent theme that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, it seems. Absolutely, that's correct. Yeah. Let's see what other uh, what other things we should take a look for. I assume that we're gonna notice this before it gets too bad, but uh, you know, what should we be looking for on some of these smaller components? Yeah, that's an example of a, a, a busted pump out cup. There's a hole there that that uh, is subtle to see, but if there's, especially if they're stored outside, rain and snow gather in that cup and uh, the water will eventually uh, gather in, in the float bay. Uh, there's, this is one example of one uh, pump out cup uh, stopper. The others are a domed version that would have covered that hole a little bit, but it will not prevent 100% from water from getting in that location. Uh, so that's why it take, to take a little bit of time and look at each pump out cup to see that they're still intact and that uh, all the, uh, the pump out cup plugs are in place uh, is important. Yeah, and, and certainly some of these things are probably more prevalent in a salt water versus a fresh water environment. You know, I, again, a lot of these things could be done when we take the floats off to make sure they're ready before they go back on instead of waiting till reinstall. Uh, but can we talk a little bit about some of the preventive things that we do, especially for our salt water operators, like those that are operating in the Indian Sea or Indian Ocean and, uh, and down in the, the Bahama areas? Uh, well, as far as uh, when you remove floats for storage, keys there are rinsing with fresh water. It's, uh, it's critical with a saltwater operator to rinse floats, obviously daily we recommend. And uh, even more often than that, if you're doing repeated uh, uh, cycles off and on saltwater to rinse, rinse, rinse. And before storage, it's even more important because that uh, the salt remnants will sit there all winter uh, just uh, doing their thing and creating havoc for your floats. So the, the biggest uh, pre-storage prevention you can do is rinse. Keep, keep all the salt water remnants off of the floats as much as you can and use grease and any, just about any kind of uh, uh, grease will work to seal the, the weather out during storage on the hardware and the fittings for the uh, struts to keep the uh, salt water from working all winter long. Yeah, and, and you know, we do also provide different corrosion inhibitor services, which again, are a little more important in salt water operations, but you know, things like Corrosion X will apply. Um, and then there are also some of our operators do use a salt scavenging solution when they wash their floats to make sure that there's no residual salt, especially when something's going to be left for a while. Uh, so I know we use Corrosion X. Um, there is that solution that we put on the hardware because it's a good time to look at the hardware and maybe replace our hardware. But I think there's there's that solution that we kind of put on them. What, what is that stuff? 
Well, we use uh, AV8 is the is a brushable product that it goes on. It's a little dark in color, and it goes on liquid. And when it dries, it's uh, it doesn't oh, gather dust. It, yeah. yeah. It it's you can actually. I mean, we've used it in areas, and if you drill, uh, aluminum filings will not even stick to it after it's dried. You can brush them away. So. Uh, and that's used very liberally on the exterior hardware uh, on all float models for salt water or fresh water to make sure that the uh, CAD plated hardware lasts as long as you can possibly make it last. Yeah, awesome. So, and, and obviously something that we can apply to hardware fairly, fairly easily. Yes, so a, a simple little paintbrush. Yeah, awesome. Let's see what else we got. I can't get my next slide. Oh, I have to. I have to undo my annotate and take that. There we go. All right. Well, that's an example of a frame. Mention the cable. cables. Yep. Yeah. The wherever the pulley, wherever the cable makes a turn around a pulley, or uh, uh, as such, this is the water rudder retract pulley. Uh, it that's where the the fraying tends to happen the most regularly. Uh, that one's a pretty severe one, uh, which is why. Uh, you use a, a rag to do that instead of your hand uh, because that will make you uh, let go very quickly. Uh, I've done it myself. Uh, and that's just, that's the cable at the, where it goes around the pulley, down where the cable connects to the water rudder has a fork on it and that will fray where that ball is swedged on to over time. And all the steering cables which exit the floats, any place you can access them, it's good to run a rag down just to make sure that this isn't happening and you would uh, may possibly break a cable when you least want it to happen. Yeah, is there something that we treat the, the cables with or something that uh, we've had a request for? Because I, I think sometimes you can take a rag and run up and down them with a little bit of, little bit of uh, lubricant or- uh, You can, uh, we order, use but... all stainless steel cables. So, like corrosion is not an issue with these cables because we use all stainless steel. Uh, uh, the as far as treating them, it it doesn't hurt to treat them at all. Uh, it's it's depending on the way you operate, you you may or may not want to want to do that. Uh, but yes, you can do it. Yeah, so it kind of depends on your situation. Yes. Let's see what we've got next here. Also back in the water rudder area, seems like we've got a. A particular area to look at between the, the cables and now now these guys. Yep, there's a, a boot or the or the uh, steering arm goes through the, the aft bulkhead of the float, has a rubber boot on it to seal out the water, and that's that's a common crack there over time. You can see that it's weather checked and uh, the harsh environments cause that. Uh, it's, it's a part that is good to check, especially if you're noticing water in the aft compartment of your float. Uh, it's a it's a good highlighted spot and a very easy check to make. You just deflect the water rudder with your hands left and right and that will reveal itself pretty quickly. Yeah and it's probably something that might be more prevalent on floats that are stored outside or maybe not climate controlled and getting a little bit of UV damage as well as sure. you know Absolutely. temperature cycles I imagine. Yep. Just a general wear item. Nobody's no rubber product lasts forever. Correct. Okay, <laughs> that's uh, that's some usage damage. It, it could be from moving floats around damage also, but uh, that that's something that uh, sometimes severe steering with under high power can cause that the blades to bend like that. Uh, it's very easy to spot center the water rudders and step back behind the float and look at and you'll see any deflection in the blade that shouldn't be there. And another thing you look for as you are looking for this is as you step back to make sure that the blades are both uh, steering, uh, have the same deflection left and right, because the, the rigging can become, if cable as cables stretch, you could get one blade that's towed in or out at the front different than the other and can cause uh, just some steering anomalies. And that's, and that's just something that could also, like you said, be checked when we do the rigging and we could make those adjustments when we put the floats back on in the yes. system, right? Yep. Perfect. Perfect. 
that's a pretty severe case of a turnbuckle that's uh, it's on a 2100 or a small float because that's an exterior steering arm. Uh, and those are obviously on the going across the top deck of the float. And that's a, that's a pretty severe case of corrosion there. Not that that makes that unairworthy. You can clean and treat surface rust. That looks fairly surface rust to me. But uh, obviously that's that's been let go long enough that you'd want to make sure you address that. Yeah, maybe and, somebody should have put a little little aviate on that puppy before, correct, yeah. before it got and, to that point. Some people use grease and grease works fantastic. The only disadvantage to grease on the exterior uh, on the top decks is that it can be a little messy, but it, uh, it it's a trade-off. It, if you want to, some of the protection you put on there may make things a little bit messy and require a little more cleaning, but it'll make the, the hardware and components last longer. Yeah. All right. Kind of wrapping wrapping up your section. Any final final notes? Obviously, we've hit a bunch of the high points, but you know it, it may depend based on what float model you're running and anything else that you'd have to add, Kurt. Uh, the, as you are getting them out of storage, the items I mentioned are are very important. But as they're being installed, things will be uh, being checked. Also, all the hardware will be checked. The uh, the rigging will be rechecked as it's put on. Uh, uh, they will be retrammed to the airplane to make sure that they're uh, that they're on squarely and that there's the flying wires are the correct tensions. Uh, the fly wires is another thing that I failed to mention that is good to look at after storage to make sure there's no damage to the fly wire uh, because a lot of, there's a lot of tension on those wires after they're put on. But all, a lot of this stuff will be checked also by the technician installing them to make sure that uh, anything that you may have uh, missed gets caught by a second or third set of eyes. Right. And now technically, we recommend owners do an actual annual inspection on their floats. But uh, as I understand it, when, when floats are removed from an airplane, they're not technically like they don't have their own annual requirement. And that's correct. It's, but However, they need to be in an airworthy condition when they're installed on the airplane. And that's a lot of what drives a lot of the inspections that we recommend. Is yeah, keep, keeping in mind, they, it is your landing gear on infield yeah. floats. So it's, uh, you do want to make sure that the hydraulic system and the power pack and everything and the wiring and electrical system is in good shape because it, it is your landing gear that you're going to be relying on. So th that's true. And our... Right. our our website has the checklist for doing these installations and the uh, and the uh, annual and, and all the 25, 50, 100 hour and 200 hour inspections is all on our website. And you can always call anytime if you have questions during this process. Uh, I'm available anytime I can be called and uh, I'd be happy to help in any way possible. Yeah, and we do have our tech support contact up there. Um, would also note that the so the inspection and maintenance manuals that Kurt mentions are available at whipair.com. You just go to the customer support tab and you will see a note there for, for service manuals. Um, did want to make one other note on the, the annual side. And I bring that up because it's common for a lot of us, especially here in the north, to annual our airplanes during the winter because it's, it's cold, it's snowy, we're not flying as much. And then maybe the floats have already been removed. We took the floats off in October. We're annualing the airplane in January in the dead of winter. And then we go to put our floats back on in April or May. Well, the float if the floats didn't have anybody looking at anything, you know, you're, you're kind of setting yourself up a little bit for failure. Like Kurt said, uh, you know, there can be hydraulic seals and just things that wear out. And if you're not looking at, if you look at them every year, it's a very minor thing. If you let it go for a number of years, now you only find out when there's a problem. So, And there are components on the aircraft that obviously are not a part of the float, so you don't neglect those. When you put the floats on, you also need to check the power pack that has that, uh, been mounted in the airplane the entire winter or off season, whichever applies. So that needs checked upon re reinstallation. Uh, yeah. and just don't want you to forget about that. Right, and checking hydraulic fluid levels and everything too. Yep. Yeah. 
Well, I've got a couple notes on on new floats because sometimes people say, well, they come around the spring. So, uh, Kurt, feel free to jump in if you think of anything. But uh, any other last thoughts before I jump into that section? No, I think we've covered it. All right. Well, we did want to make a note here uh, again when the weather gets nice. Uh, we do get a lot of questions about new floats. So there's a wide variety of floats available uh, from Whip Air. Uh, we do manufacture both amphibious and straight floats. So depending upon where you're operating, I can tell you that the most popular floats that we build are amphibious. They just they offer you more places to go, uh, more places to get fuel. You can put the airplane in a hangar every night. The you know, everything in an airplane can be a little bit of a trade off, though. And what you sacrifice when you go to the amphibs is they are going to be uh, a higher acquisition cost. Uh, you are maintaining a gear system. It's nothing major or exotic. Uh, they are going to weigh a little bit more. And then the insurance is going to be different on them because now we've we've introduced the opportunity for a gear issue. So those are things that you could you should consider as you think about what your use case for floats is. Are you you know, going water to water, land to water, do you want or need the flexibility of the amphibious float? Or do you really want the best useful load you can get going with a lighter straight float? So we support both. Uh, the purchase process for basically any float manufacturer tends to work about the same. You're gonna contact us, you're gonna ask us questions about the floats, what worked best for your airplane? What should you be considering? Uh, then you're going to tell us a little bit about your airplane and we're going to be able to figure out what the lead time is for it. Uh, speaking generically for all float manufacturers, typically there's going to be a deposit required and then a balance due upon uh, completion. Uh, some may have some different structures, but we do a, a deposit to secure your spot and get all of the little bits and pieces moving. And then we will uh, invoice the rest on completion. When we build a float, uh, we may have the hulls complete, and this is a common question, but float hulls don't do you any good unless you have all the stuff to attach them to an airplane. Other, otherwise, they're just goofy, expensive canoes. So we may have hulls complete, but when we give you a lead time, that often means that we need to finish manufacturing all the pieces that are personalized to your airplane, which you know sometimes are in stock and sometimes are different than what's in stock. Then we're going to go through and we're going to paint them. We have to provide a paint layer on them because that is part of the technical standard order to which we have to build the floats. It's part of the corrosion inhibition for the float. So uh, one question we get is, hey, can I get them bare and I paint them? And the answer is nope, because we can't actually deliver them that way. Um, things to think about as, as part of your purchase process. Uh, I am gonna add one here, uh, financing. You know, a lot of people will pay cash, but there are financers available for floats. Uh, one in particular that we've worked with recently was Airfleet Capital. You may be able to do other financing vehicles depending upon your situation and, uh, and the lender that you're working with. But, you know, there are great rates right now, so it might be something to think about. Uh, insurance is a big one. This is, you know, probably something that you've heard about no matter what sector of aviation that you are in. And there's a lot of good reading and advice about insurance out there right now, including things like, you know, staying with one provider uh, and who's staying pretty loyal, renewing early, asking things that, what can I do? What's going to change my premium? Because there are market forces at play when claims are made, but if you find a good agent, you know, they are going to shop the majority of the same underwriters, but a good agent can really work with you and understand your situation and offer targeted recommendations for you uh, to help you get through the insurance process or become more insurable and just understanding what the trade-offs are in different types of policies. Um, a lot of our owners like to do their own personal checklist. So just refreshing yourself with that. If you've been flying the airplane on wheels during the off season, or I shouldn't say off season, but the non-float season, you should be thinking about just getting yourself back into it. So you may want to create a checklist if you haven't done so already that is specific to your aircraft. We can give you a lot of things about floats, but every airplane is equipped so differently that you really want to personalize that to your, you know, your situation and also your preferences for how you like things laid out. But make sure you're getting familiar with it, get your head, you know, back in the game. Uh, you've by this point you've done all the things that Kurt's recommended. If your airplane's been hibernating, make sure it, all of its databases are up to date. Uh, that's something that we can occasionally forget during the annual because 
you know, they might be in effect at that time and then they just go out of out of date by the time that we roll the floats back around. There aren't really any software updates that are going to be available for the floats. So it's not something that you got to worry about on that side. Just kind of a general readiness perspective uh, to keep you happy and healthy. And especially as we come off of 2020, um, if you're planning long trips, make sure you got all, all your all your navigational tools, whether that be maps and charts or for flight or Garmin Pilot or any of the other other electronic flight bags out there. It's just one thing to get get into the cross country traveling mindset. Um, and we'd be remiss if we didn't provide you a gear reminder. There are a number of different discussions out there about how best to handle, you know, gear safety. We offer two different types of gear advisory system, the historic amphibian gear advisory system, which is an airspeed based system, and then the laser gear advisory system, which we introduced in 2017 and is now included standard on all of our new amphibious floats and can be retrofitted to um, any of our current production previous floats. So if they weren't equipped, they can be retrofitted. There are other systems out there. Uh, every system has its limitations. None of them will replace proper checklist usage by a pilot, consistent usage, you know, making sure that you are not just checking a box, that you're going through and you're thinking about each step. Uh, that is one thing that we think about, especially when we're flying with people who may be new to seaplanes or we're in a congested area. And as we get back out of, you know, hibernation and again, getting our minds back into to flying flow planes, uh, you know, these can be big events if we have instances with, you know, wrong position, wrong gear position landings. Uh, if nothing else, it's expensive. It can be, you know, a, a big safety hazard. People can be injured, hurt, or worse. Uh, and they are whole loss events in many cases. So it drives our insurance claims up. So there's a number of reasons to make sure that we got our head in the game here. Again, different systems. Uh, some people do like to uh, Think about the steps of a gear check in a seaplane a little bit differently. And this is one, one thing that I saw recently that I really liked. When we're landing in the airport environment, we can generally say, hey, we're flying a downwind to base and a final. When we're flying in the float plane side of things, we may fly an arcing loop because we're following, following a river or we're following around a mountain to get into a lake. And it doesn't follow that traditional downwind base final with 90 degree turns. So there are some instructors that will recommend, you know, obviously we like to say three, three gear checks and, you know, you can call it downwind base or final, but you can also start to think about it as first power reduction, first notch of flaps, you know, last notch of flaps. So because those are steps that are going to occur regardless of what the approach to the runway looks like. You should find a system that works for you, but do make sure you're thinking about it because we want everybody to have a safe and happy flying season. And with that, uh, I will say, uh, Kent, if you have any questions, uh, Kurt and I will be happy to play tag team and figure out uh, what we Excellent. got. Yeah, th thank you. A lot of good uh, things covered here. Um, yeah, there are some questions here. Uh, let's go back to the antifreeze, putting antifreeze in. How, how do you inspect that? I mean, is there, is there like a boroscope you use or is it, is it very visible? How do you, how do you inspect that? To inspect for damage, you mean, or for- yeah, uh, for Damage, yeah, for damage. Well, the, the covers on the top of the floats have uh, uh, screws in them, and those screws can be taken out by any, uh, the, the operator can check that, the, uh, the mechanic doing the work can do that. Just unscrew the, the tops, and you can look in the bays with a flashlight. You can see everything in there. Okay. Uh, water damage usually is, is, when it's there, is pretty self-evident uh, because it, it pushes around metal that you don't want moved around as that, that ice is very powerful. Right. Yeah. So, and it, it depends a little bit on the shape of your hull as well. Some floats are more susceptible to this because what Kurt's mentioning is if you have a, a float that comes down to a sharp taper, the water is going to settle in that crease here. And as the ice expands, it's going to push and it's going to want to, it's going to want to, you know, maybe pop a, pop a little tear in there or just deform that. And that's kind of what you're looking for. A flatter hull is going to be less likely to see that, but it's, you know, we still do say, hey, if you're putting those out, put some antifreeze in. Uh, one of the common uh, practices here, at least in Minnesota, is, 
you know, when you walk through the float yard, if there's a jug, an empty jug tied on there, that means that that float has, has antifreeze in there. And it's also a reminder to make sure, as Kurt mentioned, that you get that out because you know, you don't want to be pumping that out necessarily onto your airport ramp or into anything that's going to flow into the sewer or worse yet into the lake. So just make sure you know when it's there. And obviously you don't want to be hauling around any additional, <laughs> additional right. fluid that you don't need to be. All right. So when you pump this, when the season begins and you pump the antifreeze out, can you reuse that for a number of years? The antifreeze? Well, that, I, I, I think I most people sure. probably just, yeah, probably. I think most people just don't hang on to it because they got other stuff to store in the hanger, but. Right. C capturing it as you pump it out with a hand pump also could be a challenge. You have to attach a hose and, and guide it to a, a container and you could reuse it for sure. It just, uh, I think most people just don't bother. I mean, it's something that they probably just uh, discard. Okay. Okay. Um, you had talked about grease is there any type of a grease that you recommend like a like a lithium based grease for packing well I, on our website you'll find the the greases that whip air uh i i i don't want to say recommends because any high temperature 500 degree plus grease works in the wheel bearings okay. the operator can choose which grease works best for them or whatever their uh whatever their operation uses, as long as it's a high speed, high temp grease. Uh, we use something that's called green grease. It, it's literally green and it's, that's the name of the product. And it's, uh, if, if you get it on your hands, you'll know why it's very sticky and it sticks to services really well. And we, we use that, uh, we, we use that exclusively unless indicated by an operator that they use something different. And then we'll, we'll, we use whatever they would recommend, what they want. But green is what we use the most in our shop and it's available online. Okay. Yeah, it's a rental, right? well, you can buy it from us or you can buy it from, from any green grease supplier. Yeah. Um, on the new floats, we actually have started putting a sticker on there so that you know it, it actually says, you know, aircraft service with green grease or float service with green grease because there can be different preferences. And now this gets into a, a side that is a little bit above my technical level, but you do need to be cautious with the concept of mixing greases. So if you're not sure, Kurt, as I recall, the recommendation is generally to make sure that you purge everything out and right. then make sure you're replacing with something known. And this might be particularly relevant if you picked up a set of used floats over the winter and you're not sure what the previous owner used. Yeah, and we consult the log books. If we're not sure what they're using, sometimes you can tell by color, sometimes you can't because uh, some examples of greases commonly used is the green, as I stated, uh, there's stuff called HCF, which is another grease that we use that we have for operators. Uh, Aeroshell 22 is one that's also a really good grease. They're, they're all good products. Uh, usually it's, it's a personal preference by the operator as to what they use. And mixing is definitely not recommended. Uh, sometimes there's chemical reactions, uh, although I'm not a chemist, so I don't know what all those would cause, but uh, if, if a customer, if we're unsure of the grease, we contact a customer, make sure that we're putting in what they will be putting in with their own grease guns, so that doesn't happen. And if they, if they do request a change in grease, that requires the wheels, everything to come off and clean all the grease out of the bearings and the and the axles and everything to make sure that the uh, no grease mixing occurs. Okay, excellent. Uh, another question, you, you, you guys had discussed the wheels and what about wheel replacement? What, what do you ins inspect for like dry rot? How often is there a maintenance program you guys recommend for replacing the wheels? Uh, if you're, are you speaking more of tires? Yes. Okay, yeah, tires, uh, there's not really a program that each manufacturer will have uh, uh, usually pictorial type examples of what to look for, uh, but it's cracking, weather checking and cracking is a big one. And obviously constant loss of air, or if you have to add constantly, it could be a tire or a tube issue. Okay. Uh, but tires, it's usually wear and or weather, weather uh, related problems with it or skidding. Uh, sometimes uh, if, if somebody skid, you can have a flat spot on the tire. 
uh, general condition based on those items is what we look for the most. Okay, very good. Um, you already, okay, how to inspect the inside, you covered that. You discussed power packs. Uh, at what point do, do you guys have recommendations on when to replace them? And do you guys do overhauls or replacement of power packs if a customer is if a customer calls and says, hey, I've got this power pack that needs to be replaced, do you offer that service to replace or overhaul? Yes, we do. Uh, the recommendation is that yearly, the power, the, the power pack or, or the hydraulic pump reservoir be removed and uh, cleaned and inspected for uh, excess metal particles in it that would show internal wear in the system. There will always be some, some flakes of... Uh, copper colored or, or brass colored metal in it. The pistons on the actuators are actually brass. Okay. And as in any moving uh, metal to metal object, there will be some minor flakes of metal in there, but it's when it's excess that it becomes a problem. Uh, and if, if, it, if the power pack is cycling intermittently during flight and, uh, and uh, the person would like to have us look at it, yes, that can be we can contact, contact Whip Air and we can uh, bring that into the shop. We have a test bench. We'll test it, tell you everything wrong with it and make recommendations for repairs. Okay, great, excellent, good. Um, pump out cups, are they replaceable? Yes, they are. The, the cup itself is riveted from the inside of the float mm -hmm. to the, the top deck. Uh, those are uh, the, the newer ones are metal, they're aluminum. There are some out there that are plastic, but uh, ours are aluminum. And yes, they can be replaced. Obviously you pull the top cover off the float, you drill out the, top, the rivets that hold it in and you simply re-rivet a new cup in. So okay. they're relatively easy to change. And from that cup, there's a, a clear plastic hose that is guided down to the very bottom, lowermost portion of the float and held in place with a clamp. Uh, those items can all be changed uh, on condition. Okay, if somebody should, let's say somebody buys a set of floats from somewhere and it's brand X and they, and this cup needs to be replaced, can they reach out to you for service? Would you guys be able to work on brand X and replace a cup? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Part availability can be tricky on some of the older model of floats, uh, the ones that aren't currently uh, ma being manufactured. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we can work on any model of float. Okay. And, and after that, do you guys re, I don't, I don't want to use the word skin, that, that anti-skid material, do you recoat it on top afterwards with the, paint, the painting of that black uh, sandy material? Yes, our paint facility uh, can handle the application of the non-skid on different colors. You can make, you can custom make colors. Okay. And uh, the application of that is done by them on a regular basis. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, let's see here, another question is, I think this is my final question here is, the nylon rollers, you had illustrated your stainless steel cable that had uh, phrase on it, those are nylon rollers. At what point do you replace them? What's the recommendation for replacing them? Uh, there's, they, they do wear, obviously, uh, the rollers you see there are to retract, are the water rudder retract system. So they're used, uh, they're used primarily and, and actually activate when you're retracting or, or uh, extending the water rudders. And they do wear where the cable rides. Uh, the recommendation for replacement is if they, if they, there's a bushing on the inside of those that allows them to roll if they're restricted in their rotation, or if the groove that the cable wears there starts to get to where it's at a, uh, a depth that the cable might stick, it allow, there is allowable depth. It's not a really a measurement, it's a judgment call. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's really no time of recommended replacement other than the roller isn't functioning properly, or the groove is is a, a rule of thumb might be half the depth of the width of the cable. If it's the eighth, eighth inch cable, a 16th inch groove would be a good time to replace that. Okay. All right. Um, and another one, one last question here is rigging 
because there's so many different types of floats that you guys offer, if someone purchased some floats from you or they purchased Whip Air floats and they're the second owner and they don't have the original paperwork, do you guys have paperwork to help with rigging? So you'd be looking at the installation drawings for that. Now, anytime that you move a set of our floats from one airplane to the other, the aircraft itself, generally speaking, unless it's an experimental aircraft, but generally speaking, it's gonna require a supplemental type certificate. So you contact us, you can buy that STC paperwork. It's a pretty nominal fee. And with that, you're gonna get the STC paperwork, the flight manual supplement that is appropriate to your airplane. And then you'll get the installation drawings that are gonna guide you and tell you what, what's there. And we can also sell you rigging. Um, for instance, you buy floats that came off of a Husky and you want to put them on a Super Cub and you need new struts for that. We can help with that as well. But at the end of the day, no matter what, you're gonna have that STC and you're gonna get the, the drawings with it. Um, great source for information on some of the process of rigging is to talk to one of our mechanics like Kurt or to talk to our tech support department and they can give you some some of the tips and tricks they've learned <laughs> over doing a few hundred of them right typically if you if you change aircraft a, a float changes aircraft it's installed on you would likely need to purchase new cables because the cable links won't be the same mm -hmm. even if it even if it's a like aircraft mm -hmm. If you go to a different one, the cable links are likely going to be slightly different and you would likely have to buy new cables and also hydraulic lines because the lines are custom installed and custom fit to each installation. So if, if the floats change aircraft, you're going to need new hydraulic lines and cables at minimum. Okay, excellent, great. All right, well, that wraps up the Q&A. Um, some interesting information here, you know, it's kind of a, I think you take advantage or people don't think about this. You just put them on or take them off but the little preventative maintenance can really, well, like Amy said at the very beginning, the, the, a, a little bit of uh, maintenance can create, you know, resolve a lot of headaches. Long, funny long-term for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, thank you for this, you guys. Um, so again, this is, uh, I think we'll wrap this up, but thank you guys very much for this. Uh, this will be on the YouTube channels. And if anybody watching that we still people here, if you do have questions afterward, reach out to me, send, send me an email and I'll make sure Amy or Kurt receive this, um, your, your questions. And I think that with that, we'll probably wrap this up, but thank you guys very much for your time this evening. I know you guys are late, late by you, but thank you very much for that. We no appreciate problem. that. And, um, to that, I'll say good night to everyone. But uh, again, this will be on the YouTube channels and just additional questions, just send me an email and I'll make sure that Amy and Kurt get them. And uh, thank you guys very much again. Thanks everybody. We'll, thank you. we'll see you guys at Oshkosh. Okay. Okay, bye everybody. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.